So one way of implementing it is using an underlying list. So uh, we're going we're gonna to use a list where the last item in the list, or the far right-hand item, is the top of the stack. So we're going to show code for that. And then we're also going to have a list where the first item is the stack. So we're going to show two implementations. This is important. Note that the ability to change to a different implementation without affecting the operation of the ADT set of methods is the essence of abstract data type. So when you have an abstract data type, you set about a certain set of methods and how they're supposed to behave. Anyone using that abstract data type will expect that behavior to be exactly the same. And that's regardless of how inside the definition of the stack is actually implemented. So let's study our first example. Uh, this is a stack for balancing or testing of parentheses are balanced. Uh, he just shows you some code. This is actually some programming code in a program called Lisp. Uh, so this actually defines a function called square with a parameter n and then multiplies uh, n times n and that's what the function returns. So this is the Lisp language. First of all you'll see there's a lot of parentheses. So anyone who programs in Lisp has to deal with a lot of parentheses. Uh, so list has a huge number of parentheses. Language that use parentheses must use them in a balanced way uh, and it's also true of a lot of other types of symbols. So for example uh, in, in Java we use curly braces but they're always matched. Uh, we use square brackets uh, and we'll learn uh, uh, and we also do that in C++ for arrays and they have to be matched. One has to match the other. In uh, web programming with uh, HTML you have a tag and an ending tag, so these two groups of, of symbols have to be matched. And that's also true of XML. Uh, and then inside of uh, tags, you have to have a less than or greater than have to match the, less, the left and right hand side of the tag. So that's another type of thing you match. Um, a lot of, of, about these is you might nest them inside each other. So when you look at this example up here, this pair of parentheses is nested inside of another one. So consider uh, a lot of parentheses. So in balanced parentheses, uh, you always have a matching closing parentheses. So these two match, these two match, these two match, and these two on the outside surround all those. So that's a match set of parentheses. This is a match set of parentheses. Uh, this is a match pair of parentheses, but more complex. Well, if you check it, here's the outer and outer here. Here's an inner, and then this outer here uh, matches this outer here, and then this inner here matches this inner here, and this matches that, this matches that, that matches the one over here. So everything matches. These are examples where they don't match. This is obvious. Here it's obvious. I mean the first thing you can tell is if you don't have an equal number of left and right, it obviously can't match. And here's one that doesn't match. So, uh, so these are ones that match. These are the examples in the book. So we want to write an algorithm to detect if parentheses are, match, are, are matched. Uh, in other words, they all balance. And one thing to be aware of is when you look at it, um, the outermost parentheses always have to match. So, so if you if you uh, if you, it's kind of the reverse. So as you go through it, and you have the list of ones that don't match, they're going to exactly match the ones that are already. Uh, you've already looked at. So when you start seeing right-hand parentheses, there has to be one that you haven't matched. So if you put, if you remember this, then remember this, and then check this, it has to match that one. And then you have another left, you say, well, that's another one that doesn't match, and another left, another one that match, and then this has to match that, and this has to match the one before that, and so on. There's kind of a reversal going on here. So it turns out this type of pattern, where you're matching parentheses, is perfect for using a stack. Uh, the closing symbol matches opening symbols in the reverse order of their appearance. So you might want to think about that, but that's why you can use a stack for this algorithm. So here's some pseudocode for what we're going to do. Basically we're going to create a stack and we're going to have a string that has the parentheses in it. And for each symbol of the string, we're going to, if the symbol is a left parentheses, we're going to push it onto the stack Okay, if it's not a left parentheses, if the stack is empty, we're going to return false. Uh, so that means we found a symbol that was the right-hand parentheses first, 
and we haven't seen a left-hand parentheses okay, that's on the stack. Else, if there is something on the stack, we pop the stack. So the stack always represents left-hand parentheses. So we've just seen a right-hand parentheses because we're in the else. So we pop it from the stack to match it against the left-hand parentheses. Uh, it, once we're done with this if, we've looked at one symbol, we check if we're done scanning. So is that the end of the string? If it is, the stack should be empty for it to be balanced. If we still have closing opening parentheses on the stack where it's not balanced, we return false. So this is the idea of the algorithm in a in pseudocode. How it's actually implemented, uh, we're going to look at. So let's go to that. I have Python open here. And you can just use this code. You just copy and paste it right out of the book uh, for these examples in chapter 3. So this is the first way we're going to implement stack. It says here this is a version of stack where the last item on the list is the top of the stack. So we implement each of the six uh, interface items for the abstract data type. So we, imp we implement the constructor, which is what gets called when you say stack parentheses, and it sets a instance variable, which is, a, which is just a list, so it's called items. So items will hold the data for the stack. So that's our internal representation of the stack is inside of a list. If you're writing this in Java, you could store it into an array, for example, or an array list. Um, is empty checks if it's empty, so that just checks if self items is equal to the empty list. Uh, push is going to put an item on the stack, so it calls the append method for a list to put it on the right hand side of the list. Pop will remove it from the list, and there's a pop defined for list, so that does the same thing, we just call that. Peak is just going to look at the items. So it uses the index operator, gets the length of the list, subtract 1 to get to the right index number, and then just fetch that item and return it. So it doesn't remove it, it just looks at it. And then the size uh, just returns the length of the list. So this implements a stack. Okay, let's look at the other implementation. In this implementation, uh, we store the first item in the list as the top of the stack instead of the end of the list. So you'll see this in peak, it looks at the first item in the stack, and when we look at the previous version, it looks at the last item in the stack. And so we actually only had to change push, pop, and peak. So if you actually compare these, they're exactly the same except for those three. So we changed half of the methods. Push has to insert at the beginning of the stack instead of appending to the end. Pop has to pop from the first item in the stack instead of popping off the end and peak uh, looks at the first item in the stack. And that's the only difference. So this is a completely different implementation of how to do stack internally, but the methods that the user calls work exactly the same. So that's the abstract data type nature. That Once you just find the methods for your abstract data type class, uh, it always behaves the same, and the users expect that.